Welcome everybody to the first session of the Exling conference. Hope you have a lovely day. Over to Rob to begin. Okay. Uh, welcome from me as well. I'm Antonis Boutinis from Exling Society. And today we have the pleasure to have Robert Harswicker from us from the University of Ghent. And he will talk about syntactic representations across languages. Well, I remember now uh, coming back in the 70s uh, when I was studying, syntax was the center of the language. I mean, all discussions and publications were around syntax. And at this time, we were talking about universal, linguistic universals. Oh, uh, but we at Lund University doing uh, phonetics and especially prosody, which is related to syntax in many ways, we were most concentrated um, on contrastive linguistics. I mean, special characteristics which languages had. So come up, coming back again to syntax and universal or across syntax, across languages is today is as crucial as ever. And we will have the pleasure to listen to Rob. And at the end of the lecture, we will put questions and comments and have discussion. Please, Rob, go ahead. Thank you, Antonis, for this very nice introduction. And uh, your comments about um, the early days in the 70s and uh, the focus on syntax reminds me of the story that apparently at MIT at the time they had pencils made with the print syntax first on them. So I'm not sure if anyone ever saw one of these pencils, but uh, this is true. Um, thank you very much, Antonis, for uh, inviting me to the Exling uh, conference. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and thanks all for joining me today. Of course, it would have been even nicer if I could have been uh, in Athens, which I would really have liked. So let me begin by trying to share my screen and start my presentation. Um, which I will need to optimize for a video clip. Here we go. Can you see my slides? Yes, of course, yes. Okay. Then here we go with the, the content of my talk. So the title is, When are syntactic representations shared across languages? And I will introduce a new hypothesis, which I call the preemption hypothesis. I work at Ghent University, by the way, and this is uh, a nice look in the background of our, uh, our building. Okay, let's start off. Um, as as Antonis already indicated in his introduction, uh, if you compare the syntax of different languages, then there are often commonalities between the syntactic rules in different languages, but there are differences as well. And an illustration of this is something you can see on the left side of the screen in the green frame. For instance, if you take passive sentences in English and Dutch, you will see that there is a passive in Dutch that is syntactically quite similar to the English passive. It has the biphrase at the end, but there's also a passive that puts the biphrase in the middle and puts the, the verb at the end. So one structure is similar, one structure is different. If you look at datives in English and Dutch, they seem to be similar. Both languages have the dative alternation. That is, there's a double object or DO, Native, like the clown shows the waiter a book. And there's a PO, prepositional object dative. The clown shows a book to the waiter. And those structures are similar in Dutch and English. Now the question that's been, uh, you know, 
intriguing me for a decade or two is whether bilinguals, and I mainly work with late bilinguals, have shared or separate representations for structures that are similar. In principle, um, if structures are similar, there could be separate representations. And in this case, bilinguals would keep their two syntactic systems apart, and there would not be much of a cross-language influence. But if late bilinguals share representations when they can, when the representations, when the structures are similar enough, then this would lead to cross-language influences. Now, if we look at bilingualism and late bilingualism in general, then um, it's clear that they are not two monolinguals in one mind. There is a plethora of evidence for language co-activation during production and comprehension at, for instance, the lexical lab. Cognate words, words that overlap in form and meaning, are read and spoken more quickly than non-cognates. Uh, false friends, on the other hand, um, words that overlap in form but not in meaning, tend to slow down uh, reading. And if you look at auditory word recognition, there is an influential study by Marion and Spivey that showed that Russian English bilinguals, when they hear the Russian word Marku, which means stamp, will spuriously look at a marker, an object uh, with an English name that is similar to the target language, in this case, Russian. So the two languages of bilinguals seem to interact at the level of the lexicon, but what about the sentence level? If there are cross language influences at the sentence level, then you might expect sometimes a phenomenon like this one, want you a cookie where a Dutch English bilingual uses a Dutch sentence structure in English. But how do we study this? One approach might be to simply observe and see whether we find uh, instances of cross-language influence. In my approach, however, we use an experimental technique, namely structural priming, to study syntactic influences across languages and to manipulate, to have control over such influences. How does structural priming work? Well, there are different versions of the task, but one way of doing it is having a picture sentence matching task. So participants see a picture, are confronted with a sentence like, the man is reading a book to the baby, a PO dative, and then next describe a picture. For instance, this picture over here, and they're free to describe it any way they like, and might also describe it with a PO dative, in which case, there's uh, a persistence of the structure they processed in the prime trial, the picture matching task trial. Um, Catherine Bock, already in 86, was the, the pioneer of this paradigm and demonstrated with a task looking roughly like this, that participants when confronted with PO data in the prime task, we're more likely to produce a PO data response in the picture description task as compared to when a uh, prime sentence was a double object or DO data. And the same was true for actives and passives. If in a version of this task, you had a passive prime sentence and you had a picture like a church being hit by the lightning, for instance, that people were more likely to use a passive response rather than an active response. That's structural priming. And this uh, phenomenon has been shown using many different sentence structures, different versions of the paradigm, and in, in different languages. Uh, recently, Mahawald and colleagues, sorry, this should be 2016, not 2006. Um, Mahawald and colleagues demonstrated that this is quite a robust phenomenon in a meta-analysis of the literature. What Mehawald and colleagues also found was that the main moderator of structural priming is lexical overlap between prime and target. So if the verb used in the prime to read in this case is also used in the target, then the priming effect is substantially stronger as compared to 
having different verbs in primary targets. And this increase of priming with lexical overlap is often referred to as the lexical boosts of priming. Importantly, for my story about um, cross-linguistic effects is the fact that there's cross-linguistic structural priming. This is something I, together with my colleagues and Lobel and Bock, showed roughly around the same time. Lobel and Bock showed priming of these datas, the DOs and the POs, across English and German. Um, so given an English DO, people were more likely to produce a German DO and the same for a PO. Interestingly enough, they found no priming of actives versus passives in the study, not between English and German, but also not within German. In my own study, which I will show you on the next slide, we showed priming between Spanish and English, uh, passives and actives. And then a few years later, we showed priming of the PO and DO datives within and across Dutch and English. And on the slide over here, you see some of these results. This is the 2004 study I was referring to with Spanish and English. You can see on the slide that we had a range of different um, prime structures in Spanish, an OVS structure, an active sentence, but with the order of subject and object reversed. We had an intransitive baseline sentence, an active sentence, and a passive sentence. And this, these sentences all mean something like, the taxi is chasing the truck. And what you see on the slide over here is that given a passive prime, there were many more passive responses as compared to the other three conditions that didn't differ that much from each other. So there was priming, let's say, of passives between English, between Spanish and English. And on the right graph, you see the results from Schoenberg et al's study uh, on Dutch and English. You can see here that there was priming in every direction, going from L1 to L1, L2 to L2, but also between L1 and L2 and L2 to L1. And what you see here is that there's also evidence for the uh, lexical boost. So the graphs here are, is the percentage priming yeah, rather than the percentage of DOs or anything like that. So this is a different score. Percentage of POs after a PO prime minus the percentage of POs given a DO prime. So the basic priming effect, which is larger if there's lexical overlap, uh, the red bars as compared to when there's no lexical overlap. Now this priming effect, this, uh, this set of results basically led to um, a bilingual lexicalist model that is strongly influenced by uh, earlier proposals by Leifeld and colleagues and by Pickering and Brannigan, in which the, I'm sorry, lexical level um, can be conceived of as uh, consisting of different strata. You have a conceptual stratum where you have conceptual nodes like show something to someone. And you have uh, at the lexical stratum, you have uh, nodes for word categories and for particular lemmas, for particular verbs. So you have representations for show in English and give in English. And crucially, you also have representational nodes for the combinations that go together with particular verbs or other lexical hats. So for a data verb like show, there is a node representing the prepositional object structure and another one representing the double object structure, right? If you produce or comprehend a sentence with a PO structure and the verb to show, then these nodes show and PO are involved in your selection. Now, importantly in this model, these nodes are shared across the languages so that we have a single PO node that is used for both Dutch and for English. So the Dutch verb tonen is connected to the PO but also the translation equipment in English, the verb to show. And verbs themselves on the other hand are tagged for language, hence the Dutch and British flags that I put on the slide. 
So a main assumption then is that syntax can be shared across language and that this shared node between the two languages is the vehicle from which you get these cross language framing effects that we saw before. And the main assumption is that such nodes are shared when the structures in the two languages are similar enough. But then at this point, I think you should ask the question, okay, but when are structures similar enough? Hmm? Because structures uh, may look a little bit like each other in different languages, but there might be considerable differences between them. So how similar can structures be in order to get shared? And before I continue, I should first point out that um, the nodes we presume are shared um, are not identical. So Spanish and English transitives, for instance, are not fully similar. If we have something like the cat chases the dog, then in Spanish, you get a gato persigue al, a, el, perro. So you get an extra little preposition here. Right? Um, so even though the actives look like each other and there's cross linguistic priming, there's a difference between the structures. There's priming between Dutch and English uh, of the genitive alternation, the hats of the nun versus the nun's hat. But this alternation is different between Dutch and English, both in terms of morphology and pragmatics. In terms of morphology, we use a clitic in English, uh, we attach it to the noun. In Dutch, there's a freestanding pronoun, meaning her. In English, you can say stuff like the bicycle's wheel. In Dutch, that's impossible. The, uh, the, this construction requires an animate um, a possessor, so to say. Nevertheless, we find priming uh, between Dutch and English, despite these differences. So structures don't have to be fully identical, but how different then can they be? And that's the question I wanna talk to you about. Now, one candidate for uh, really blocking syntactic sharing is word order. As I mentioned before, Löbel and Bach observed no priming between uh, English and German transitives. Um, and one reason why this might be the case is that the word order of a passive is different from that in English. In English, we put the by phrase at the end. The concept was attended by many people. In German, you put the by phrase in the middle before the verb. So is that perhaps the reason? Well, perhaps. Um, another study that we conducted uh, a number of years ago seems to be compatible with this idea that a difference in word order blocks syntactic priming across languages. That's a study by Bannerle et al. using adjective noun combinations versus nouns that are modified with a relative clause. So in English, you have the green sheep and the sheep is green. In Dutch, the order of the words in the relative clause is a little bit differently. We have the adjective noun combination like in English, but the relative clause becomes something like the sheep that green is with the verb at the end. And the same is true for German. The schaaf das grün ist. Now, in Sarah's study, she uh, tested five directions of priming. And what you see on the slide now is the percentage of relative clause responses. In the Dutch Dutch condition experiments, the pattern is very, very clear. Uh, given a relative clause prime, the orange bar, there are many more relative clause responses as compared to an adjective noun prime, the blue bar. If you test within English, you find almost identical results, very clear priming effect. But what do you think happens when we prime from English to Dutch? Where, remember, the uh, relative clause has a different word order. But this is the answer. It's almost nothing at all. Right? There's no priming. There's hardly any relative clause responses that are being produced in this case. And if you go from Dutch to English, 
They're a little bit more, um, but this is still only 4% relative close responses. It doesn't differ significantly from the AN condition. Now we go from Dutch to German. And what happens now? Where the relative clause is the same order as uh, in both languages. This is what you get. In this case, the priming has returned completely. Uh, so this sounds very compatible with the idea that uh, syntactic representations can be shared across languages if they have the same word order. And that's what this slide basically says. It summarizes these findings. Global and Bach did not find priming between German and English with a different order. Bernard et al. found no priming between Dutch and English for the N plus RC structures, which have a different word order, but did find it for Dutch to German where the word order is the same. So is it the case that structural priming across languages is only possible when word order is identical? And that's a claim that is often found in the literature. And many people start their reviews of the literature with that claim. And what I want to make clear today is that that claim is wrong, and I want to debunk it. And to do so, I will show you five counterexamples, um, starting with this counterexample from 2009 uh, by Bannerley et al. What we did here is prime passives between Dutch and English. And we had um, three conditions in this particular experiment. There were active prime sentences in Dutch. There were passive prime sentences in Dutch that had the same word order as English, by phrase final, uh, referred here to as the uh, PFP, prepositional phrase final passive. And we had a passive that had a different order, namely uh, with the biphrase immediately. Uh, yeah. So the church is by the lightning hit the PMP. If it's the case that, uh, you know, structural primary cross languages requires uh, the same word order, there shouldn't be any priming from the Dutch PMP to the English passive which can only be the PFP because English doesn't have the same flexibility in word order. However, as you can see on the slide, uh, given an active prime, there are many active responses and few passives. Given the prime with the English word order, there are many more passives and hence fewer active responses. So a very clear priming effect. Crucially, the passive in Dutch with the different word order from English leads to almost the same uh, result as the one that shares the same word order. It's a little bit less priming, but the difference is very, very small indeed. So this is suggesting that priming is possible across languages, even despite the difference in word order. Here's counterexample two. This is a study that's uh, primed between German and English, a study by Weber and Indefrey. English, as you know now, has the biphrase final word order, the tree was painted by the artist. The German equivalent has the verb final, so biphrase medial. Um, so that's very similar to the two conditions uh, you just saw before in the previous example. They used fMRI and they used an fMRI repetition suppression design. What does that mean? That means that if you present a stimulus and a little bit later you present a similar stimulus, so the brain picks up on the similarity between those two stimuli, stimuli, then in relevant brain areas, you find a decrease of activation. Yeah? Activation is suppressed because of the repetition. That means if the brain sees the similarity between the passive in English and in German, certain areas of the brain should respond uh, less when a passive in English is followed by a passive in German. And this is exactly what you can see over here in three areas of the brain, the 
inferior frontal gyrus, the precuneus, and uh, the middle temporal gyrus. In all of those areas, it is the case that if um, you have a German passive followed by an English passive, um, you have less activation than if you have a German sentence followed by an unrelated uh, English sentence. So having the same structure leads to suppression of the activation. And you see this also within English. Um, you see the same difference between repetition versus non-repetition in those other areas of the brain. So again, priming despite a word order difference. And the next two examples are uh, similar in a way. We talk about passives again, but now between Korean and English in a study by Wang and, and colleagues, um, where the main difference is that uh, in English, we have an SVO word order. The policeman chased thief or a thief was chased by a policeman. Whereas in Korean, we have an SOV word order. So policeman nominative, thief accusative, chased, or in the passive thief nominative, policeman dative was chased. So that's quite a large difference, you might argue, in, uh, in structure. Nevertheless, there is priming from Korean uh, actives and passives to English actives and passives. Uh, in the active condition, there were 64% actives in the cross-language uh, experiments. In the passive condition, only 56% actives. And similar results uh, priming between Korean and English were obtained by Shin and Christiansen. And Chen et al. found something similar between Mandarin and English sentences with a different word order. And this brings me to my fifth counter example. And this is from a study that used an artificial language. The advantage of teaching people an artificial language is that you can control almost every aspect of it, um, including things like the word orders that the language allows or doesn't allow. So we created an artificial language, which we called PPO2. And we created two versions of PBO2, one that had SVO word order and another very similar with SOV word order. And people learned this basically in one session, they could already produce sentences and do a structural priming task in our artificial language. I'll skip over all the, the details of the learning. We um, taught our participants, uh, hold on, Somehow, okay, something went wrong here with my slides somehow. Um, slide 16, yeah, here we are. So um, we um, taught our participants this language. Uh, you see some details here about the lexicon that we uh, taught them. And we used pictures and action movies to introduce the vocabulary and all the different sentences. We in fact created a large corpus that's also freely available for who's interested of little action clips, for instance, of a boxer hitting a sailor, which doesn't seem to work. Let's try it again. There you go. Okay. So they learned this um, in a number of sessions with uh, vocabulary learning, exposure to sentences, sentence clip matching, production training, and then crucially a structural priming block. Now, what you see here on the slide, it's a very full slide. I apologize for that are the priming effects. So how much priming was there in every condition? When priming uh, from PPO2 to PPO2 for, uh, in related conditions, unrelated conditions and between languages. Crucially, there was a language 
with the SVO word order, that's the red bars, and a language with the SOV order. Those are the blue bars. And the crucial thing to take away from this slide is that the red bars and the blue bars are always very, very similar. There's never a, a difference between them. So for the priming effects, especially the ones across languages, it doesn't really matter whether the prime sentence is the same word order as Dutch, SVO, or a different word order, SOV. So is it necessary to have an identical word order to obtain cross-linguistic priming? The answer is no. There are at least five studies showing cross-language priming despite word order differences. Then you might ask, okay, but there was Lebel and Bock and it was Venerle et al. Why didn't Lebel and Bock find priming for transitives? I don't know. It could possibly have been a power issue of some sort. And it's important to point out that there was no priming for transitives within German for in Lebel and Bock's study. But what about Venerle et al? I mean, they had power enough to find clear priming within Dutch and within English and between Dutch and German. So that couldn't have been a power issue. Um, so what's going on there? And here I introduce my hypothesis, namely that syntactic sharing of the two word orders of the RC in Dutch and English was blocked or perhaps preempted is a better term by a competing construction in Dutch. Let me explain what I mean with that. So one possibility one could think of is that even though German and Dutch have a verb final relative clause, as you can see uh, over here, that they merge this in one node that they share with English. So perhaps have a sort of situation like this, where a lexicon has an English lemma, a German lemma, and a Dutch lemma that are all connected to an adjective plus noun node and a noun plus relative clause node. And then uh, language specific rules work out the details of the RC later on. But the commonality, let's say, of this structure would be shared between the three different languages. Why is this not the case? And because if that were to be the case, we would have found priming between English and Dutch. Well, my suggestion is that the reason is that Dutch needs to keep apart word order variation in the relative clause that is not present in, in English, not present in German. In particular, Dutch has a construction with an auxiliary and a participle, the sheep that is sheared, which allows the alternation uh, with the verb at the end or not at the end. So the sheep that is sheared, the sheep that sheared is. Dutch has those two different word orders and therefore needs to represent this variation, which English and German don't have to care about. So, um, Sometimes the, the slides get stuck. This is why we go back and forth a little bit. So the, the model I have in mind for the Dutch lemma level, we have uh, the lemma for sheep, the adjective is noun combinatorial node, the one where you have an adjective and is, the sheep that green is, but also these two, auxiliary and participle, is sheared and participle and auxiliary, sheared is quite possibly Node two and node four are collapsed together. Yeah? The sheep that white is, the sheep that sheared is. Uh, that's an empirical question. In any case, because Dutch needs to make this distinction, it can't just collapse all the different orders across languages together in one shared node. The next example um, comes from the artificial language studies that we've done. So priming is possible um, across languages that have actives and passives, but have SVO word order in one language and SOV in another language. Um, and this is something 
you can see illustrated over here. So our PPO2 might have the lemma vibe or something um, and have SOV actives and passives. This can nevertheless be shared, but such sharing is not an option if we have an artificial language that not only has the SOV active and passive, but also has an SVO active and passive. Because in that case, the system needs to keep those representations apart and will share only the SVO active and passive with English. And these connections over here, but will not make connections between the active SOV and passive SOV connections to the verb. Right. And this is something that um, we tested in an experiment where we created a version of our artificial language, PPO2, which allows both SVO and SOV. And we did priming from the artificial language to the artificial language and from the artificial language to Dutch. The orange bars in this data graph show you SVO, the blue bars show you SOV. And what's crucial here is that um, priming was always larger for the SVO condition as compared to the SOV condition. And that seems uh, compatible with preemption. So there's stronger priming when um, the language, when, when the word order is the same than when the word order is different because having the structure Having this distinction in PPO2 blocks the sharing of the SOV active and passive with the Dutch active and passive. But it's not absolute preemption because there is still some priming, right, between the SOV conditions and the uh, SVO passives in Dutch. And this really, uh, because this structure is really similar to the uh, study I showed you before by Meulet at all 2020, the effect is really due to having both orders. If you have a between subject design, so a version of PPO2 that is SVO and a version of PPO2 is SOV, then there was no difference between the priming of an SVO and an SOV. It's having those two orders that makes all of the difference. Now, to sum this up, syntactic structures can be shared across languages, despite differences in morphology, pragmatics, and I would argue even word order. But such sharing is only possible if there's enough room in representational space. And I showed you two examples of preemption. One of them is the noun plus RC uh, structure in Dutch. Sheep that is sheared, because a sheared is, preempts the sharing of the Dutch and English structure and the active and passives in the artificial language where having both SOV and SVO preempts the sharing of SOV in the artificial language and SVO in Dutch. I want to put it a little bit more, uh, more formal and abstract. So the claim I am making is that structure X in language A, X in language A, and structure X prime in language B can be shared, can be collapsed, let's say by the, by the L2 learner, if and only if neither language A nor language B allows both X and X prime. You get the scenario you can see over the slide, on the slide over here. But on the other hand, if language A happens to allow both, as you see over here, then even after learning, uh, the language for uh, the other language for quite a while, no collapsing of the structures, no sharing of the representations is possible because language A needs to keep apart X and X prime. Okay, my slide is, was stuck again. Yeah, so to conclude, um, I have a few points for discussion. First of all, the preemption hypothesis I uh, presented here does not come entirely out of the blue. It has similarities with accounts of cross-language influences in bilingual children, especially proposed by Hulk and Miller from uh, 20 years ago. 
Um, in construction grammar, there's also the notion of preemption. So the existence of a better alternative uh, often preempts the extension of a uh, construction. So it's also inspired by that. Um, the idea of preemption resonates also with some ideas from learning theory, such as the phenomenon of blocking in classic conditioning. So you can't make a new association if there's already an, a, a previous association. Another point for discussion is that this, of course, uh, is a new account that clearly needs further testing. So based on uh, the properties of German and English, and the fact that in the end people's relative clause construction in German, um, there is no freedom of word order. My prediction would be that there would be priming between the schaf das grün ist or something in German and the sheep that is red in English. Third point for discussion, and then I'm almost done, um, is that I sometimes say, okay, German doesn't allow, for instance, uh, the prepositional phrase final passive, it only allows the PP medial passive. It's not entirely true. Um, some word orders are possible in some varieties. So uh, this, is, this might be a, uh, a caveat we have to consider. It's also the case that our second language system is not only shaped by exposure and by more implicit learning processes. Explicit learning also plays a major, major role. One example of this is that French Dutch learners in Belgium strongly prefer the PP medial passive in Dutch, even though French only has the PP final passive. So this surprises really uh, a lot. And the reason seems to be explicit instruction. This is how they are instructed. And then finally, um, to wrap this up, um, I always talked about uh, similar representations being shared across languages, but an alternative to having just one representational node for a, a structure that is used in both languages would be having separate representations, but ones that are connected to each other. And shared versus connected models are very difficult to tease apart empirically. And, uh, for some discussion about this issue, I refer you to uh, Van Gompel and a Rice study paper in, uh, from 2018 and my own from uh, 2016 in JML. And with that, I would like to uh, wrap this up and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for that presentation, Rob. If anyone has any questions or comments, please raise your hand. Oh, let me unshare the presentation uh, so we can see each other. Okay, I can't can't see any question. Oh, yes, we have one raised hand. So the first person, please go ahead. Uh, well, if nobody else would come in, I have. Uh, well, Rob, I have a lot of questions. Okay. I don't know where to start from. I start from a very, very simple but elusive question is, and I will combine it with comments, and then I will ask your judgment to what I say mm -hmm. and response. Okay. My main question is, what is the function of syntax in spoken communication. We assume that spoken communication is the first and written, for instance, communication is derived, a technical representation. Okay, so for the younger, we would say that before the 50s of the last century, there was no syntax. Linguistics was uh, phonetics, phonology, and morphology. 
and then came the so-called transformation of syntax according to which syntax was everything. The deep structure was equal to the logical form, the semantics, the meaning. It is very strange because in Greek and Italian, you can't say in some type of sentences, you can't say a question with any syntactic or lexical means. You have to modify your intonation only. Mm -hmm. Or in Greek, you can have commands, questions, requests with the same morphology and syntax. Even in English, you may have a command with a question. Will you shut the door? Or you may say, please, will you shut the door, please? And with intonation, you indicate a command, order. Well, now my approach has been, I'm a problematic because I see syntax as putting mm. words together and combining. Ma cos'è la dilatazione dei bacinetti renali? Somebody has, Matteo Paolo has come in. Okay, well, uh, the thing is that we combine words for, in order to construct bigger linguistic units. But if those words, they have a specific order, you can vary them. If you can't vary something in language, it has no distinction, it's predictable. So, and then to my question, what is the function of syntax? I mean, when we plan to speak, Mm -hmm. We plan longer semantic units in the first place or, or information units. And then we have to provi provide air into our lungs. Otherwise we have four starts, not enough air. And then comes other things like syntax, morphology, etc. So syntax to my mind today is a lot Prefabrique. You can't play very much with syntax in order to have distinctions. <laughs> so I come about again, like a student in your introductory course in syntax or linguistics. What is the function of syntax? Okay. It's a very you... nice, nice sort of question. Maybe I should start answering. Um, so in a sense, I mean, uh, I am certainly not someone who says that syntax comes first or that syntax controls everything. Um, let's say um, a sum from a generativist tradition might do or have done in the past. But at the same time, I mean, I wouldn't throw away uh, the baby with the bathwater and say that uh, despite the importance of all the other levels, syntax plays its role as well in um, combining words and allowing for uh, a gradient of expressivity because of the, the combinations. Um, I come from this not as a linguist, but as a psychologist, a psycholinguist, who is concerned about the, the psychological reality of syntactic representations more than um, what the, the functions are of the, of the level in, uh, in communication. Um, so from my sort of uh, perspective, the thing that I really wanna know is, okay, um, if you, want to claim, let's say, that two structures are, are different and can be characterized by a particular syntactic structure. But then you need to find a way of showing that this is real in the mind of the speaker somehow. And this is why I think 
uh, syntactic priming is uh, such a nice tool because um, if you can prime something, that to me means that this has psychological reality. This is something that's, that's present in the mind of the speaker. Yeah. At the same time, I mean, uh, yeah, I think the, the question of the functions of, uh, of syntax, that's a, it's a fascinating, a very broad question. I mean, I don't really have a, a good answer for you at, uh, at the moment. Yeah, but yeah, I think your point is, uh, is well taken. But still, I mean to say, if we make, when we speak, for instance, a foreign language, if we make a mistake in syntax, it's right away, it's noticed, it's bad. So we, we can't put linguistic units in the wrong place. From this aspect, syntax is very, very important. And if we mess around with word or order or so, uh, uh, the linguistic message is not intelligible, I think. From, from this aspect, I think that syntax is very important. We have to say things right, simply. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Rob. Thank you very much. Thank you. We we will certainly continue our discussion about the, our things. What I now I'm a retiree, but anyhow I was advocating an a multifactorial model according to which we have morphology, syntax, prosody, whatever, and they interact with each other. Because, okay. mm -hmm. I mean, if you study only syntax, you can't see the real picture. I mean, we have to study whatever, even morphology, in, in a multifunctional system. And we have to look the interaction among different components. Yeah, yeah I think I would agree with that. The sort of perspective uh, in general. That's yeah. that's yeah. our yeah. job yeah. in experimental linguistics and the conference. Yeah. So we yeah. need all, and I like your approach, the psychological reality. Ah, uh, that is on, that is not only in syntax and in some other components, but it's very much like this in phonetics and phonology. Because when we speak, we don't utter in casual speed we leave out syllables and so, and the brain reconstructs this. So it's a psychological thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, okay. Rob. Thank you. Okay. We also have uh, more questions actually, if the second, the next person with their hand up would like to ask a question. I think that should be me. Uh, well, I do have a question uh, related to um, pragmatics. So you already mentioned that um, even if uh, pragmatics is not the same uh, between two structures, there is still they can still be shared. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have a comment on this? And the second one is um, like. Well, when you presented the passive, um, the, the example with the passives in English and uh, Dutch, mm -hmm. I was thinking about the structure in Greek. And um, so in modern Greek, it's actually passive is used for, I would say, like formal context. So my question is, can it be shared? And um, then even if, uh, so when listening to a passive, in English, can it be that the node that is connected to this formal context is also activated when I hear a listen to a sentence in English? As I mean, as an L1 Greek speaker. Yeah. I mean, I have the impression that um, Greek then might be similar to Spanish in the sense that uh, it's not such a common, uh, common structure. But nevertheless, you do find. 
clear priming effects uh, between them. Um, the example I gave uh, in my talk was also with, with genitives between English and Dutch, for instance. You cannot use the genitive um, in a very formal situation. So you can't really say the queen her hat, for instance, because when you talk about queens, you would tend to, uh, you would need to refer in a more respectful way. Yeah? So that's a sort of pragmatic factor that nevertheless doesn't block this, uh, this priming effect. I think one thing that's important to keep in mind is that um, other factors, other linguistic levels might come into play and might even sometimes be um, co-driving the, the priming. That's most obviously the case for lexical overlap, um, which uh, is, I think, the strongest modulator of, of priming. But another possibility is um, information structure, for instance. So passives and actives also differ in information structure. Is the, the agent or is the patient more emphasized in the, in the sentence? And uh, so, I mean, uh, Antonius was mentioning a sort of multifactorial uh, account. So I think it's conceivable that uh, those different levels in the system also play a role. And that in that sense, we can't ascribe everything to just one shared uh, or separate syntactic node. Does that answer your question? Yeah, totally. <laughs> Thank you. We also have another person who's raised their hand if they'd like to speak next. Yes, um, so thanks for your presentation today. It was very interesting. Uh, so most of the studies that you um, described today in your presentation um, have been conducted with uh, late bilinguals, uh, but some studies testing early bilinguals have shown that you can prime cross-linguistically a structure that is ungrammatical in one of the languages. So how would you explain that phenomenon? Would you say these people are connecting structures that shouldn't be connected? Um, I don't know. Okay, so how would that work? Would, were those cross-linguistic uh, syntactic priming experiments but presenting a structure in one language that didn't occur in another language? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you okay. prime a structure that exists in one language to a different language, um, yeah. and you get a priming effect. So people are starting to produce an, uh, basically ungrammatical structure in, um, mm -hmm. yeah, in, the, exactly. in the L2. Mm -hmm. yeah. Generally. yeah. That is actually super interesting. And uh, I would appreciate it if you could send me the, the references to that, uh, that research. Um, yeah, because this really boils down to um, the question of uh well how you produce a sentence right is it the case that you select one of those combinatorial nodes that i showed you in the model and uh start producing from that um if that's the case then the phenomenon you describe basically requires that the participant creates a new combinatorial node for this ungrammatical structure basically on the fly after one or a few presentations. Uh, and that, I mean, it's not totally an, uh, inconceivable because from our artificial language learning uh, experiments, we can really see that people can uh, create structures in new language pretty, pretty quickly. The alternative would be that there's somehow contact between the lexicon of one language and the structures of another language. And in that case, what they should, what they're doing in the situation you described, is that they are selecting the structure from language A in which they were primed, and inserting words in it that have the right word category from language B. And um, yeah, I think it might be an interesting puzzle to find out how precisely it works. Huh? Which of those two explanations might be the right one? Okay. Thank you. Okay. We also have one other person who's raised their hand if they'd like to go next. 
Yeah, um, thank you for the talk, which is um, very interesting. So I have a question about, um, um, uh, um, so, so in terms of like um, composition model, like different languages use like, like different cues for like sentence interpretation. So for example, like um, according to that model, English tend to um, rely on like primarily like word out the cue before like Chinese and, and Japanese, um, they tend to rely more on like animacy cue. So um, I just wonder like in um, cross-linguist priming study, how would you account for um, those kind of like cross-linguistic phenomena? Yeah. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. So I think the, the work you're referring to is mainly work in, uh, in comprehension, right? So um, where um, in English, you would rely more on, on syntactic cues, but more semantic. Uh, in, in Chinese, for instance, you would use more, uh, more semantic cues for interpreting that, uh, that sentence. Um, and this is something I find uh, very interesting. The sort of models I showed you have no account for that particular phenomenon. Um, but in some of our work, we've speculated a little bit about this phenomenon and um, argued that uh, this may have to do with a greater diversity of word order options and syntactic uh, possibilities you encounter in, um, in Mandarin, for instance, as opposed to, to English. So um, because the syntax doesn't allow that much, doesn't give you that much in terms of prediction, um, you're much more reliant on semantics to make predictions and comprehension as compared to uh, English, where the, the syntax is pretty much, leads you pretty straightforwardly um, to a good prediction. Does that answer your question somewhat? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. If uh, we could conclude this section and start paper 24, please.